Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see y'all this morning. It is strange, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm so tempted to make a, a scathing political joke. I'll try and tone it down. There was a movement in Congress to abolish daylight savings time. But if we were wondering whether or not the government could actually get anything done, they couldn't even get that done. So anyway, <laughs> well, here we are. But I will say this. This is the first Sunday that we've been together in November. Not only that, but that means that Thanksgiving is coming right around the corner. And of course, Thanksgiving is just a stepping stone to Christmas. So Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> oh, goodness. We are going to continue our study in Daniel here in just a moment. We are going to be looking at Daniel 8, starting off in that. We'll spend at least a couple weeks in Daniel 8, because as we saw in Daniel 7, there's a whole lot to unpack uh, in these sections, especially these latter sections in the latter half of the book, uh, as we're trying to unpack these uh, prophecies and so forth, as well as seeing some of the parallels between, for example, Daniel and Revelation that we looked at a while back. So uh, we'll do that here in just a moment, but as we begin, let's bow in prayer. Our Lord, God, and Father in heaven, we are thankful as we come before you, Father, for the blessings you've given us. Lord, as we stand here in a dry and comfortable space, as the rain has fallen around us, we're thankful for the comfort we have, and Father, also thankful for the rain that we have had, Father, as the land needs it and can be a blessing for us, Father. Lord, we're thankful for the reminder that you send rain on the just and on the unjust. We are thankful that that means that all those who have not found you, have the opportunity through your blessings to see a glimpse of you and become right with you, Father. Father, we ask that as we are striving to serve you, that we would use such opportunities to help reach those who are in need of your word and of your love. Lord, there are so many that we could mention that are struggling right now with various issues, many struggling with physical disease and other issues like that, Father, but Father, even as we pray for them and want those things to be better, we recognize that the true danger is that Satan will use those or any other things in people's lives to uh, pull them away from you. And Father, we ask that most of all, even beyond uh, everything that we want to do for those who are struggling physically, uh, that we would be a strength and encouragement to those who may be struggling spiritually so that we can uh, encourage and strengthen one another in that way. Lord, we ask that as we approach the election this week, that once again you would help us to uh, be uh, representatives of your kingdom, despite what may happen in the kingdoms of this world, whatever it may be. Father, we ask that we may remember whose we are, remember that you are in control, and that the rise and fall of this nation has nothing to do with the rise and fall of your kingdom. Father, help us to recognize also how your providence can be used, and that even perhaps if things don't go in a way that we would like, uh, that that could be used to your glory even more. Father, we ask that you would help us to uh, remember that uh, as we are striving to live our lives for you, uh, that, Father, everything that we may be passionate about, everything that we may care about, whether that be our families, whether that be our nation, whether that be uh, our jobs, anything that we care about should be dwarfed uh, immeasurably by how much we care about you and serving you. Father, help the people around us, whatever else they may know about us, to know that we serve you. Not in an overbearing way where we are trying to uh, be uh, intolerable in how we uh, try and share the message, but simply a, a very natural and honest way of letting people know this is who I am. Father, help us as we study this morning, as we try and understand your word better, as we understand the amazing prophecies that are in your word. Help us to gain a deeper appreciation for you and what you've done. Help us to continue learning and growing. And everything we ask that you would bless us and help us to be pleasing to you in all that we do. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Last week, as mentioned, we looked at Daniel chapter 7. Uh, specifically, we wrapped up our discussion of Daniel chapter 7, talking about uh, two aspects of this vision that Daniel gets in this chapter. Uh, talking about the Son of Man and this little horn. 
And basically, we talked about uh, the uh, Im impact of this throne room scene where the Son of Man, uh, of course, that's not necessarily a messianic title. It's just a, this is a human, and specifically, we could say maybe a representative of humanity. But in the context, it does certainly seem to be messianic. Uh, this figure is given a kingdom. This figure is seen to be uh, worthy of a kingdom. He's presented before the king, if you will, seeing if he's worthy and of course, as we kind of put everything into place, put all the puzzle pieces together, we see uh, that fits very well with a prophecy of the one who would come at the end of that list of kingdoms and be able to establish the kingdom of God, which, of course, uh, would fit Jesus as well. And we talked about the little horn, which ironically is very closely connected to, uh, or maybe not ironically, but interestingly, uh, is connected to that, that uh, son of man because the little horn is essentially the one that is going to raise himself up, he's going to exalt himself, and that's going to be right around the time that this son of man is given the kingdom. And we talked about different explanations for this little horn, but uh, seemingly, although again there's a lot of debate out of it, uh, from my perspective, meaning in my opinion, based on the evidence, I think that the best explanation of this little horn would be someone along the lines of Julius Caesar, because he's described as being, uh, in the time of the Fourth Kingdom, he's described as putting down other kings, if you will, other uh, rulers of the Roman Empire. It's right around the time, if you remember, Julius Caesar sets the stage for the emperors, and the first emperor is in power when uh, Jesus is born. So well, the timeline would make sense. A lot of that would make sense. People have also suggested others, but again, we talked about that last week, so I won't go back over that. And that's what we talked about at the end of Daniel chapter 7. So now we're going to get into Daniel chapter 8. Once again, uh, this is probably, this whole section, uh, but even this chapter in particular, is probably not one that we're very familiar with. And I just mean that in general. When we read Daniel, we don't usually focus on Daniel chapter 8. In fact, even those who focus a lot on the prophecies in Daniel usually focus on Daniel 7 or Daniel 11, uh, but Daniel 8 is not usually the one that's most focused on. There's a couple of reasons for that that we'll probably talk about as we go through this chapter uh, this week, and then, I guess not next week, but in a couple of weeks, because we'll be gone next week. Uh, but uh, we'll be looking at a lot of these different elements as we kind of break this down, but as we did with chapter 7 this morning, I just want to kind of give us the bird's eye view. I want us to get the impact of the vision as a whole, and then we'll start kind of, uh, I hate to say picking it apart, but you know what I mean, <laughs> breaking it down, maybe is a better way to say it, uh, in future uh, weeks. But uh, for now, I just want us to get kind of the bird's eye view as we look at this. So we're going to go through the vision. We're going to try and highlight a few things that maybe kind of stand out, and hopefully one of the big things that we're going to do is create some questions in our mind. Even as the, uh, the vision itself will answer some questions, we also should have some questions coming to us. So uh, we'll go through the vision as a whole as we did, and then we'll ask some questions and talk about some questions as well that come up as we move through. We should be familiar with someone falling asleep and having a dream at this point, right? This is at least the fourth time, if not more, that this has happened in the book of Daniel. Uh, some of it being in the first half of the book, and even in the last chapter, this is how it starts. Daniel is uh, sleeping, has a dream, has a vision. Now, it's interesting, as we begin in chapter 7, we're told that he gets his dream of chapter 7, this vision of the four beasts, in the first year of Belshazzar. That's the king, if you remember, that has the handwriting on the wall happen to him eventually. This vision, this dream, comes to Daniel in the third year of Belshazzar. So it does happen after this vision in chapter 7, but this is still before some of the events that we've already seen in the first half of Daniel. For example, the writing on the wall hasn't happened yet. So he has a dream. He begins to have a vision. Again, similarly to uh, Daniel chapter 7, he is by a body of water. But this time, he is not by the sea. He is by what's called the Ulai Canal. Now, it's a canal in the area where he is in Mesopotamia, and that's really all we need to know about that, right? It's just uh, not the sea, which is interesting. So he's by this canal, and he sees on the banks of the canal two figures. First, he sees a ram. He sees this ram, and this ram is very interesting to him. Uh, this ram, it has two horns, and I can't really, I couldn't find a picture that depicts this very well, but these two horns one of them is raised a little higher than the other horn. And it's interesting, that second horn that's raised up higher, it actually comes second. So you have a horn essentially arise somehow on or grow out on the ram, 
And then a bigger horn grows out next that's taller than the first horn. And this ram, it is very, uh, how shall we say, it becomes very powerful. It begins to move toward the west and toward uh, the south and towards uh, the north. And it's just, it's very uh, uh, powerful. No one can stand against it. It's doing whatever it wants to automatically, especially since we've read Daniel 7, we're like, okay, we're not actually talking about a ram, right? But uh, that's how this ram is described in the vision. I would be interested to see visually what that would look like in a dream. How do you have a ram moving in these directions? But anyway, this ram is uncontested for all intents and purposes until another figure shows up on the banks of the canal. This figure is a goat. Now, I tried everything to find a goat with a horn in between its eyes, as is described in the thing. Now, I guess technically that will be a unicorn, but that doesn't look like a goat either, so I'm like, okay. I even tried to get AI to generate an image of a goat with one horn in the middle. And AI, as smart as it is, could not fathom the idea of a goat with the horns anywhere but right here. It's really funny to me, actually. So, nonetheless, we have a goat, but it doesn't look like a normal goat. It looks like maybe what we would call a unicorn goat. It has one giant horn right in the middle of his forehead. Now, this horn, we're told it shows up from the west, as he's standing by the canal, and it comes across the land without touching the ground. Now, just real quickly, what do you call that if something is traveling without touching the ground? Fly. It's flying, okay? He doesn't quite say it that way because for them, we have to remember, for us, when we think of flying, there's all sorts of ways you can fly in our imagination, right? Or even in real life. You can fly like a bird, you can fly like a plane, you can fly like Superman, and I'm not actually being just kidding about that. Even we think of like superpowers, people being able to fly in that sense. There's all these different ways we think of flying. In the ancient world, you fly with wings like a bird or you don't fly. So I think that's why he describes it in the way that he does. He doesn't say it's flying, but that's what it's doing. And we understand that even though it's not quite worded that way. So it's coming across the ground from the west, from far away along the bank of this canal. It's coming and it's, it's going so fast, it's not even touching the ground. It's not stopping, it's flying across and it's heading towards this ram. And as it heads toward the ram, you're like, oh, wow, we're getting to see a fight, right? Uh, have you ever seen like rams or goats kind of butt heads and stuff like that? That's kind of what we're picturing here. Well, that's not what happens. The goat finally gets to the ram and just, bam, it's done. <laughs> Immediately, it just flattens this ram. It breaks its two horns. It, it stands over it. I mean, it's just, it's no contest. And the goat then becomes very strong in the place of the ram. The ram became strong, well now the goat becomes strong. And so the goat is standing here over the body of the ram, it's becoming very mighty, but as it becomes at the height of its power, we're told that one horn is broken. That giant unnatural horn in the center uh, between its eyes, it's broken off. And in its place, four horns grow out. Now again, I even tried to get a generated image of a goat with four horns. Does not compute. But nonetheless, we then get a goat with four horns that are growing out of its head. And this uh, goat, again, still is uh, rising in prominence, <laughs> I guess we could say. Again, strange to describe animals that way, but of course we're not really talking about animals. But as these four horns grow, Daniel sees something that's very interesting. In fact, he sees something that should be familiar to him because he saw this in the vision of another kingdom. He sees a little horn. Again, I'm using real goat pictures here, but he sees a little horn, just one, not two, but just one of these kind of probably looks something like this. And it's creeping out among these four big horns that have grown up in place of the one horn. And he sees this, uh, this little horn and it begins to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And of course, this is strange, it's confusing. He's like, what exactly is going on here? And then we really break with the imagery because then this horn begins to boast great things. And the horn doesn't have a mouth, right? But uh, here we are. The horn begins to boast great things. Not only that, this little horn, now we're really going out there, it grabs some stars out of the sky and hurls them to the ground. And of course, the entire earth is destroyed and the goat dies because that's what happens when you hurl stars to the ground. Well, that's why this is imagination, right? It takes stars and it throws them to the ground. 
Nothing apparently actually happens, but it's a demonstration of the power and the exaltation of this little horn. And even as it's doing this, the horn then exalts itself, if you will, uh, to the east and to the south, and we're told to the glorious land. So now it's going in some different directions than the ram originally was. And as it is exalting itself in these ways, we're told that it begins even to, uh, how shall we say this, be antagonistic, become an enemy to the saints, the holy ones. We think of saints in a Christian sense, but remember that just means holy ones. That was used in the Old Testament of God's people, the Jews. And so it exalts himself against them and even takes away the sacrifice, the sacrifice that is uh, traditionally made to God in the temple. It even takes that away. And we're told, someone asks, there's just kind of this voice out in the vision, someone asks, well, uh, how long will this sacrifice be taken away? And the answer is given as well, another voice coming from somewhere, and the answer is given that it will be taken away for 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, if you want to run the math on that, there's not really anything clear as far as how the math stacks up. Uh, for example, they would probably do somewhere in the 360-day uh, calendar is usually what a standard um, uh, ancient calendar was, something like that. Whether you do 360, 365, 365.25, which is the technical accurate one in modern day, uh, it doesn't add up to anything. You don't have an equal number of years or months, I don't think even, uh, for this uh, 2,300 evenings and mornings. So it's just this, this number. It's six plus a fraction uh, of some kind. Uh, and of course, if you're familiar uh, with numbers in terms of how they kind of work, uh, 23 is a prime number, which means it's not divisible by anything else. So that's another aspect of this as well. So anyway, uh, this is going to keep on going for 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, this voice says, and then the sacrifice will be restored to its normal place. So Daniel sees all this stuff. He sees uh, the ram show up with his two horns. He sees the goat flatten the ram. He sees uh, the goat's horn be broken, these four horns, and then this little horn that exalts itself uh, to the point of even stopping the sacrifice to God. And of course, as with the last vision, Daniel's confused. He wants some explanation. He wants something to be given to him to try and unravel all of these things uh, that he has been shown. Oh, I almost forgot to uh, depict the stars being thrown down. Sorry about that. So uh, he wants some clarification on all these things he's been shown because obviously there are similarities to something he's already seen in another vision. Uh, we have beasts again in a sense. We have some things like that. But there are also a lot of things here that are very different and don't really make sense. And so... He is, again, seeking someone to explain these things. Man, I keep skipping that. I do that every time. Sacrifice being taken away. Anyway, there we go. That's where we are. He's trying to find someone to help him out. He's trying to find someone to explain these things. Now, if you remember in Daniel 7, the vision that he has, he just sees someone standing nearby, and he walks up to him. He says, hey, bro, can you explain this to me, right? That's essentially what happens in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 8... He's wondering what these things mean in this vision, and he's still in the vision, of course. He's, he's trying to see what, what might be an explanation, who can explain this to me. And this time, we're told, he sees a figure who has the appearance of a man. That's not how the figure in chapter 7 is described. It's just he sees someone there and goes up to him and talks to him. He sees this figure with the appearance of a man. And as he sees this figure appear... There is a voice that speaks to the figure and says, Gabriel, names him Gabriel, says, Gabriel, I want you to explain to Daniel uh, the meaning of these things he has just seen. And so Gabriel approaches Daniel, and Daniel is terrified. Daniel falls down on his face. He's trembling in fear. Gabriel walks up to him. He touches him and says, Essentially, I'm going to tell you things that are coming at the end or something along those lines. And as he touches him and begins to speak to him, Daniel essentially falls into a deep sleep in the process of all this. But Gabriel continues talking to him and letting him know what's going on. And so Gabriel tells him, I'm going to tell you what these, uh, these figures, these beasts, represent. Now, unlike chapter 7, 
He's just going to come straight out and say it, which is very helpful for us. He says, the ram with those two horns, that represents the kings of Media and Persia, or the kingdom of Media and Persia. They are going to become very great, but uh, then they are going to be taken down by another kingdom, which once again is just explicitly identified. That is the kingdom, Gabriel tells Daniel, of Greece. Greece is going to take down uh, the kings and the kingdom of Persia and Media. And when he takes them down, when Greece takes them down, its first king, which is that horn, that big horn that you saw, the first king of Greece is going to be taken out, right? And in place, there are going to be four kingdoms that arise in the place of this one king. And they're going to divide toward the four winds of heaven or something along those lines. You know how that language usually is used. And then among these kingdoms, when their treachery or whatever uh, we want to describe it as has reached its limit, it's about full, there's going to be a king among these four kingdoms that's going to rise up. And he is going to uh, begin uh, making himself great, exalting himself, acting against God's people, taking away the sacrifices, all these kinds of things. And ultimately, that's going to last, just like the vision that you saw, Daniel said, that's going to last for 2,300 days and nights. But you need to seal up this vision because this is about a long time from now. This isn't going to happen for a while. So seal it up so that future generations can know what's going to happen, but it's not in your lifetime or anything like that. And finally, just like last time, even after all these explanations, I mean, Gabriel literally names some of the kingdoms that are involved in this, or really, he names the two kingdoms that are involved in this, because we've got two, not four this time. And yet Daniel, as last time, is still very, very confused and terrified and doesn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> now, I imagine... If you and I had any kind of vision, like Daniel has multiple times that are recorded throughout this book, and of course that might not even have been the only visions that Daniel had in his lifetime, but those are the ones recorded for us. If you and I had any visions like this, I think we would be scared too. But it is interesting, as we saw last week, or last chapter rather, it is interesting that even though both times he's given some explanation, he's still both confused and scared as we wrap these things up. So that's the gist of it. I try to kind of give us the, the big picture kind of idea, the overview of this vision. We should already have some questions for him, but let's kind of go through. And as we go through, let's ask some of those questions. And if you have other questions, please feel free uh, to bring them up. But let's go ahead and ask this one as we get started, uh, trying to kind of wrestle with things in our mind. How is this vision similar to or different from the previous one? We already mentioned some of them, but anything stand out or come to mind, especially things we haven't already mentioned, about how this vision in chapter 8 is different from the vision in chapter 7? He uses living things. Do what? He uses living things instead oh. of images. I mean, okay, good. Both images. Even those four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, I'm glad you brought that up. Those four beasts, we have the fourth one, of course, is not compared to anything, right? It's just this crazy beast no one's ever seen before with iron teeth and all this. The other three beasts, they're described in a very interesting way. The first one is described as being like a lion. The second described being like a bear. The third described as being like a leopard. But as Ralph points out, they're not actually described as being a lion, a bear, and a leopard. They're described as being like them. They, they have the, uh, the similarities enough that we can say, oh, that looks like a bear, but it's not actually just described, that's a bear. In chapter 8, in these visions, we don't have a beast like a ram and a beast like a goat. We have a ram and a goat. I mean, it's just all there is to it. It's very interesting. Very good. What else? What else is different or similar to the last vision? Do what? They represent other things, the beast and the lion, and the, and then the two goats now, or the horns, represent other things. Okay, good. Just like the last vision, we have 
uh, things that represent other things, but these two represent different things than the other two. Now, we're going to talk about, especially next time, excuse me, that uh, there is some overlap here, and we'll talk about that in fact in just a second, a little bit, and then we'll go more into that next time, but uh, simultaneously we have very, uh, what do you call it, um, very uh, symbolic imagery being used. The, the creatures aren't actually creatures. We're not actually talking about animals. We're talking about kingdoms, right? But also, we have different animals being used for potentially some of the same kingdoms in different ways. So, yeah, a very, very good point. What else? What else do we see that's comparison and contrast between this and the last vision? They're all about kingdoms. Okay, good. We're talking about kingdoms that are going to arise, and especially from what we're given in chapter 8, seal up this vision, it's going to be a while, right? We're talking about future kingdoms, not just kingdoms in general. We're talking about kingdoms that are going to come to pass long after Daniel's lifetime. What else? Anything else stand out, how the vision is similar to or different from the previous one? We already said we actually get an interpretation of specific kingdoms, that's one thing. Anything else? There's one more that we'll come back to in a second, but let's move on to another question for now. What does Gabriel tell us, tell Daniel, but us by extension, about the more dramatic aspects of the vision? Now, I didn't read it right straight up. If you want a, a more uh, a detailed description of what Gabriel tells Daniel, uh, then of course you just read the text. But he explains something about this little horn, right? That's where, remember, the vision gets crazy. This little horn is, is grabbing stars and throwing them down. How does Gabriel describe that? Or what? how does Gabriel interpret that, maybe is a better way to say that. Does he tell Daniel at some point there's going to become uh, to come a king out of these four kingdoms that arise from Greece, and this king is going to find a way through scientific advancement to harness the stars and bring them down to the planet Earth? No. How does Gabriel describe these dramatic vision aspects of the vision? His power will be mighty, but not his own power. What does that help us with as we're reading Daniel? What has Gabriel just told us? Think Revelation class. God is in control. Okay, God is in control. Good. About the symbolism specifically, we have stars being thrown down. Gabriel tells us this king is going to be powerful. That's what that means. What does that tell us? Don't take figurative images literally. So that over and over and over again in Revelation, right? Gabriel's just explicitly saying, here's what you saw, here's what it means. Those are two very different things. Stars being thrown down and a king being powerful are two very different things. And the one is not to be taken literally when all it's trying to do is indicate the other. It's a dramatic way to say this king is going to become very powerful and try and make himself even more powerful than he actually is. But that's very different from how people, and they don't do it as much with Daniel, they certainly do it with Revelation, try and make actual stars falling to actual earth and all these kinds of things. Literally, Gabriel has been told, I want you to give an interpretation of this vision, and he's telling Daniel, this is what it means. And from our perspective, that should tell us, oh, okay, I need to be careful about taking this too far beyond what's actually intended by the text. Well, let's ask another question since we're talking, uh, well, uh, we'll ask this question first. I thought I had them in a different order. What effect does the vision have on Daniel this time? We talked about he's afraid, but look at that last verse in the chapter. What, what effect does it have on him this time? Is there any difference between how he feels 
after this vision and how he felt after the last vision? Ah, okay. If I remember correctly, in Daniel chapter 7, when I compared the two, the last verse of chapter 7, the last verse of chapter 8, he's confused, he's, you know, afraid, he's keeping these things in his heart. I don't remember him literally getting sick. Now, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but at least when I did, when I did the comparison, I don't remember anything about him getting sick in Daniel chapter 7. Why does this have that kind of effect on him? Or why might it? I mean, we're not told, right? But if we had to speculate, why, why, are, why are we told, oh, yeah, he literally just <laughs> physically is sick for days after this? I mean, it's not like Gabriel, as he was leaving, is like, oh, by the way, you have a stomach bug now. Here you go. <laughs> I mean, what's going on? Well, he was appalled by it and didn't understand it. Hmm. It bothered him. I want us to think about a couple of things. First of all, Belshazzar. Third year of Belshazzar. That's who's in power right now in Babylon when Daniel has this vision. What kingdom is Belshazzar associated with? What is he the king of? Anybody remember? Well, Bonnie didn't say it out loud, but she mouthed it. Babylon! He's the king in Babylon. Now, if you remember the writing on the wall, he is the last king in Babylon. Technically, he's not even the king of Babylon. He is king in practice while his dad is off doing whatever he wants to do, studying something, all this kind of stuff, because he doesn't really want to have the duties of a king. And that's, of course, what we get from history rather than from Daniel. So Belshazzar, I don't think we're ever told what year of Belshazzar's reign the writing on the wall actually happens. But my understanding is we're not talking about a very long time. So we're right towards the end of Belshazzar's reign when Daniel has this vision. And the nations are given to us by name. Medo-Persia and Greece. As Daniel is serving in Babylon under the Babylonian Empire. Because of the timeline, there are two things I can tell you with certainty, even though they're not spelled out for us in the text, the readers are expected to know because they are kind of more familiar with this history than we are, so we have to do a little more digging. Persia is not an unknown name when Daniel sees this vision. They are a rising power and already most likely being viewed as a potential threat. Not only that, but we talked about fairly recently who were allies with Babylon in the Babylonian kingdom before Persia takes over? Who were some of Babylon's allies? Anybody remember? The me. The Medes are actually allies with Babylon and part of the Babylonian kingdom when Nebuchadnezzar is in charge. Which means the Medes are about to change sides if they haven't already. Daniel gets this vision. Remember what does it say? The Medo-Persians are the ones that are represented by the ram. That means Daniel's being told not only is this kingdom that's being perceived as a threat about to be in charge, they're not yet. But the kingdom is going to be comprised of two different elements, one of which, at least until recently, was allies with the people now in power, who you're serving, Daniel. But not only that, the kingdom you're in right now is about to be taken over by the Persians, but they're not even going to last forever. They're going to be taken over too. I want you to picture it this way. If you had to guess, and I'm not trying to be in any way political, controversial, anything, but just by what is put out there in our country, if you had to guess who the biggest threat from a military, political, geopolitical standpoint 
is to our country? Who is most likely to attack us in terms of not terrorism, but like actual full on attack? Who would it be? China. I heard like five China whispers, and the Roth was brave enough to say it. Okay, China. Let's just go there. Imagine China is already perceived as a potential threat to our country by a lot of people in America. China, if you ever take over, I'm just saying what's true. I'm not coming up with conspiracy theories, okay? China is already perceived as a threat. Imagine if you suddenly had a vision as an American in the 21st century that said, I'm going to show you these two kingdoms. One of them is China, and they will rule over the world for a great period of time, and they will be unstoppable. And then, right after that, or not right after that, but after that, after they've been powered for a while, there will come this other power. Canada. I don't know. <laughs> that, that would be funny, right? Canada. And they will just crush China, and they'll take over for a long time. Now, if you, as an American in the 21st century, heard that China was about to be the world power, and then another power even was going to take over them afterward, you think you might be a little sick to your stomach for a little while? Hopefully that kind of helps us get the impact of what's going on here. One more question. We're going to throw this out there, and we're not really going to answer it, but I want us to be thinking about it again. A lot of these are questions I want us to put out there as questions to have in our minds unanswered so we can mull over them for a little while as we prepare to start breaking some things down more specifically in this chapter. How does Daniel respond to the messenger in Daniel chapter 7? We talked about it a little bit. He wants to know the interpretation and the vision in Daniel chapter 7. What does he do? He sees a guy standing there, he walks straight up to him, he says, hey, tell me what's going on. How does he respond in Daniel chapter 8? A figure shows up, is identified as having the appearance of a man, which is not a description given in Daniel chapter 7 of that angel. This figure is, given the, or is described as having the appearance of a man, is named Gabriel, which, by the way, itself is an interesting definition of the name, if you look up the name. One who is like God, if I remember correctly. Although that might be Michael, but we'll, we'll talk about that more next time. So if I'm wrong, I'll correct myself later. He shows up, and what does Daniel do? Falls on his face in fear. At which point, Gabriel walks up to him, raises him up, says, No, 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 don't be afraid, don't bow down to me, don't do any of that, I'm just a messenger. He doesn't do that. Angel in Revelation does that at some point. And then Gabriel reaches out, touches Daniel as he's beginning to explain these to him, things to him, and Daniel falls asleep. This falls into a deep sleep. Who is this guy? What exactly is going on here? And why would Daniel be so afraid of him when he clearly wasn't afraid of another literal angel who was standing there in the last vision he had? Interesting stuff that we will talk about later. For now, as we wrap up for this morning. We have a second vision. Hopefully we've gotten a sense of the big picture of the second vision. We have a similar insight in the second vision into the future, as Liz said, into the kingdoms that are coming, into how world events are going to transpire. We, we have a similar insight that God's giving Daniel into the future. And it leaves us, yes, with some answers, but also with even more questions. Not just us, but Daniel as well. We're going to dig more into it as we move forward. But I hope, as we move towards the next couple of class periods, we'll try and wrestle with some of these questions. We'll try and dig into, okay, what, what does this mean? How would I go about answering it? And hopefully, as we go through class, that, that will benefit us moving forward. Any questions or thoughts before we close? Thank you. The other question is, why tell him anything? And why tell him anything? Very good question. We'll talk about that in Daniel chapter 11. <laughs>